burning large area high quality glass cutting with femtosecond bezel beams. I want to welcome you guys uh, in our chat and all around the world in these days of a very special situation. And we are, we, we are very happy to welcome you um, to uh, let you know our um, recent, recent research on bezel beam based um, cutting. So we are uh, two, basically two partners. Uh, there's uh, on the one hand side, Kylabs, who um, developed the uh, optical system and also um, provided the optical system to LZH. And um, on the other side, there's LZH who did some um, experiments in the laboratory and we want to show you our recent results. So in our agenda, we will first start with a short introduction to um, laser-based glass processing and um, uh, by myself um, and a short introduction to Laser Center Hannover. Then uh, Gwen Poyer will uh, continue with the um, vessel beam generation and Axicon manufacturing. Hi. Hi, everybody. So I'm Gwen from Kydabs, and uh, I'm happy to be here with you. And uh, followed by uh, the uh, optical setup in the laboratory and uh, the um, thin glass cutting experiments by or shown by Mike Steinbach. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike. I'm working at LZH as a processing engineer. Yes. So um, um, please don't uh, leave this webinar afterwards. So please come back or still or stay tuned. We will show a small video uh, to prepare the discussion. And afterwards, we are very welcome you to the discussion round with your questions. You can already type your questions into the uh, chat window and we will uh, come up with these uh, later on to um, uh, trying to answer them. So first of all, maybe, um, and to do it a little bit more interactive, I want you to uh, specify why are you here and um, Please, maybe you can um, uh, select the buttons. Uh, what, uh, what's your interest uh, at the moment over here? And uh, mark, the, um, mark the boxes. So let's continue with the uh, presentation. And first of all, I want to give you a small introduction to our um, institution. So Laser Center Nova is a non-university, non-profit research center for photonics and laser technology found in uh, 1986 by three professors who were working on, um, on the one hand side, the optics, quantum optics, the material science, and thirdly, uh, engineer, production engineering and machine tools. Um, these three guys uh, found this uh, institute or organization to um, lay down the fundamentals in um, laser matter interaction. So um, we are located in Hanover, that's in um, the mid of uh, Germany, and uh, uh, we have around um, 180 people working at Laser Center Hanover, and uh, 133 of them are scientists working on the fundamentals, but also for direct industrial applications. Um, most of our um, um, financial support comes from um, public funded projects in different uh, fields, regional, national and international, and also directly um, worked uh, projects with industrial partners. So maybe you identified already that uh, we want to bridge uh, the fundamental research into industrial applications by working uh, with um, uh, scientists and engineers together in at LZH. So um, we have two departments who are uh, concentrating on uh, the fundamentals, uh, developing optical components and systems and also laser sources. Uh, we have a big uh, department for bi biomedical photonics where um, our scientists work on uh, biophotonics, laser medicine, or also biomedical engineering, for example, by establishing uh, laser surgery. 
A very big part uh, located for, for the um, engineering part is the optical production technologies. Here, um, we are covering different materials and um, processes, for example, surface processes, generative processes of metals and non-metals, and also um, ultra-short pulse, uh, very micro-based uh, processing. So in the department Mike and I are located in is the production and systems department. Here we are aiming for different uh, materials and uh, these kind of processing topics. For example, uh, the composite materials group is working on the functionalization and structuring of repair preparation, um, efficient and low damage 3D and 2D cutting, but also welding and um, process monitoring. In the group of additive manufacturing, non-metals, um, we are concentrating on polymers, but also on multi-materials where we combine different materials for multifunctional um, um, pieces and uh, are also covering um, a part that deals with micro um, additive manufacturing. So we also have the laser micro machining group where uh, Mike works for different topics, for example, um, the ultra short pulse laser based uh, um, microprocessing for uh, surface functionalization, um, drilling, cutting, but also um, for uh, thin film structuring and the integration of uh, strain gauges on uh, mechanical parts, for example. And a uh, group, the glass group I'm working in. Um, we have different topics uh, in our group, so um, very traditional is the marking, cutting, drilling topic. And um, in addition to that, uh, we are also um, dealing with coating, coloring, functionalization. So um, the ablation of materials, but also the application of, for example, um, silver uh, nanoparticles, microparticles, um, based on uh, the one hand side um, spray coating or also dip coating and the thermal annealing afterwards. A third big topic is the welding and uh, joining where we use uh, CO2 laser for the um, uh, joining of different um, float glasses or also the additive manufacturing where we applied our um, welding process to a 3D printing approach. So uh, let's have a closer look to the material glass and also the topic today, marking, cutting and drilling. Um, what are the advantages of glass? So glass uh, is a material that is used for, for, for thousands of years, you can say, and um, applications can be found in a variety of uh, fields. For example, uh, used in displays uh, for smartphones in the uh, automotive sector or also smart homes. Um, used in electronics, in the OLED um, production or photovoltaics, uh, architecture, of course, everybody knows this, and even more applications where you have extreme conditions such as high temperatures or also corrosive environments. So um, glass has some extraordinary um, properties such as, as the uh, transparency, the chemical inertness um, and the thermal stability so that you can use this material in, a, um, in extreme conditions and all, of course in a lot of visual applications because in, uh, in the visual range it has a very high um, uh, transparency and can be used in this uh, kind of applications. So how, do, how can we use these, uh, these glasses, this um, float glass, um, plain glass materials, we basically scribe and break them. This is a technology uh, based 100 years ago uh, by scribing with a mechanical wheel on the, on the surface and then to cut the whole piece afterwards by breaking. Uh, nowadays and uh, some decades ago, also laser-based cutting techniques were established and uh, here we are aiming for different um, criteria. So uh, on the one hand side, we have the quality criteria. When we think of uh, substituting the uh, conventional way by laser processes, we have to take care of chipping, induced stress, or also the surface roughness should be as comparable as possible. 
but uh, for our um, processing technology, we need to uh, consider uh, aspects such as uh, geometrical ones, as uh, the aspect ratio, uh, curvature radii, or also the taper. And process-wise, uh, we often have not only a one-step process, but also some post pre- and post-processing steps. So if we now have a deeper look into the um, cutting topics, we can identify different um, technologies that are able to cut glass. So on the one hand side, we have uh, the typical laser ablation techniques where we use the laser for um, ablating, subtracting material uh, layer by layer, I would say. And uh, we have a very high flexibility uh, within this technique. Um, but there are also some disadvantages. So other techniques are also developed, such as scrap and break, quite comparable with the conventional scrap and breaking process. So first we um, induce uh, local defects on the surface and afterwards we can break them. And um, yes, for some uh, years now, um, also volume modification based uh, techniques are available. They are working with a very um, dense uh, laser beam where uh, ultra short pulsed laser uses the nonlinear um, absorption inside the glass uh, with a normally transparent, um, uh, for the glass, transparent laser beam. But uh, with these very fine um, beam shaping, we can use it for the modification of the glass inside the material to induce some kind of um, uh, um, crack um, um, induced uh, uh, centers. And uh, sometimes uh, if you don't have a hardened glass or, or chemical treated glass, uh, it will not cut by itself or separate it by itself. Then of course we need a second step by a thermal induced um, separation. So today we will focus on the uh, laser ablation, but with uh, I think a uh, very high potential also for applications for the modification part. And therefore, I want to um, uh, give the voice to um, Gwen for the continued um, introduction. Hi. So let's see. Hi, hi everybody. It's nice to be uh, here with you. Thank you very much, uh, Anne, for the, the kind introduction and for all the explanation about uh, the glass cutting uh, application. So my name is uh, Gwen, as I uh, did say at the beginning of the webinar, and I am from Kylabs. And I will be explaining uh, what Kylabs we, we bring to that collaboration uh, for improvement of the, the, the glass cutting uh, with femtosecond uh, laser. So I will just start with uh, a short introduction about uh, the company, uh, which uh, you might uh, not know uh, already. So Kylabs, we are focused on beam shaping, and that's actually what we did bring to that collaboration. Uh, we are a, comp a young company. Uh, we were founded uh, six years ago. We are in uh, France. And over the years, we were focused on uh, a unique technology, which is called uh, MPLC for multiplane light conversion. It's actually a technology uh, pretty original of beam shaping. So basically, it, it can be applied to a lot of different uh, areas. And in order to investigate all those areas, we, we have raised uh, funds over the years. And last year, for example, we, we did raise 8 million euro, which actually was the, the, the biggest fundraise in an optical company uh, for, uh, for 2019. So just want to quickly mention that uh, over the years, uh, we've been always uh, followed by uh, Safran, who trusted us and uh, we, with whom we work uh, actually quite a lot. So as I was saying, there are a lot of possible applications to uh, MPLC, and I just want to quickly mention, uh, mention them. So over the years, we, we started uh, by developing uh, the telecommunication area first. And basically, uh, we have three product lines for telecommunication. So Aruna is a product line for the, the improvement of local network, uh, uh, I would say, local network uh, rate. Then we have Proterus, which is uh, actually more focused on the, the network of the future. It's a more uh, product for laboratories who are investigating what will be uh, the, 
the telecommunication uh, in, uh, in a few years or in a decade. And then uh, the, the last product for telecommunication is Tilba, uh, which is also uh, which is also um, uh, focused on um, telecommunication, but a different telecommunication, which is free space uh, communication. So it's telecommunication between the ground and the satellite. You. So I just see that there are some people who cannot hear me. So I, uh, I'll, I'll do my best. I, I try to speak slow, and hopefully you will be able to uh, follow. So um, uh, I was saying, yeah. So it's uh, you've probably heard that uh, there are uh, SpaceX, for example, who um, want to um, develop uh, uh, satellite constellations. So it means a lot of satellite all around the world, and it's actually very complicated to communicate between the ground and the satellite. So uh, we have proved uh, last year that actually our technology was uh really good uh for um, the improvement of the this uh this link so quickly um uh, we'll uh, mention kylabs inside it's actually all other application it means a lot of defense application and we also have a lot of biology uh, application we have also custom project for specific uh people specific customers but today we are here to talk about canunda so Canunda is uh, our material processing uh, product line, which uh, I'm product line manager of, and it's for material uh, processing in a large sense, meaning there are a lot of different applications actually inside Canunda. It can be laser beam welding for automotive. It can be also, um, for example, uh, watchmaking or jewelry making with femtosecond laser, and it can also be uh, glass cutting uh, with uh, our Canunda XCAN product. So as you can see, uh, there is a lot of area of uh, interest in common with LZH, and hopefully we will collaborate on other topics as well. But today we are here to talk about uh, glass cutting. So how how to how to cut glass? Uh, Aunt uh, did explain that uh, quite well already, and uh, you could see on his uh, scheme that uh, one of the the interesting way to cut glass is uh, to to drill holes through the whole uh, thickness of the glass. So uh, a good way to do that with a, a laser is to have really high aspect ratio beams. It means that you want to have a really long beam, we, which, which uh, will show uh, quite smaller uh, widths. So the classical way to do that is uh, to use an axicon. So basically here you have a transmissive axicon. You have the beam uh, coming in on this side and coming out of the axicon um, through this uh, conical uh, plane. So the beam will have a conical face, and when uh, both uh, beams will uh, will uh, meet, they will interfere, and uh, this interference will actually create this very intense uh, beam uh, and very long beam. So you have to imagine, of course, that all this is in a three dimension. So these axicon, they 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 are the the best way to generate this really high aspect ratio, and they are perfect for drilling uh, through glass. But the thing is that uh, this uh, classical way of generating bezel beams with transmissive axicon has limitations. I would say that basically you have uh, two main uh, limitations. The first limitation is the blunt tip. So the way you manufacture these uh, transmissive axicon, you always have a, a round tip uh, at, the, at the top of the axicon. And then you have a part of your beam which is getting out with a conical phase and you have a part of the beam which is getting out with a spherical face, a small part of the beam, but still a part of the beam. And both this, uh, these two parts of beams will interfere uh, as well, I would say, and they will create oscillations. So oscillation, you can see them uh, along the optical axis over there. So why the, it, it's actually pretty bad, it means that uh, either you will be below the ablation threshold uh, somehow in some areas, and you will not ablate the, the glass, Either you will be above the ablation threshold everywhere, but uh, where you have the high intensity, you will be uh, too much uh, above this uh, threshold, and you may create damage in the in the glass. So that's uh, actually one big drawback. The other drawback is that we are using femtosecond laser. So because they are femtosecond, they have to have a broad spectrum. So broad spectrum uh, doesn't like glass. Uh, when you go through glass, all wavelengths are seeing a different index. 
So you cannot actually keep the pulse duration uh, with a transparent hexagon. Then uh, if the hexagon heats up because you are actually sending quite a lot of energy inside it, well, the index will change and then the, the different wavelengths will, will again see another, uh, another class index. So all these are quite limiting uh, for the Bessel beam generation for high quality glass cutting. What we have uh, developed in uh, K-Labs is uh, another way to generate those Bessel beams with a reflective axicon of high quality. So I will just quickly explain how it works. You have your input beam getting uh, on the axicon, then the output is with an off-axis angle, then the setup are easier to, uh, to, to make. You have your Bessel beam just there when uh, both beams uh, interfere, and on the far field you have a, a ring, actually similarly to transmissive axicon. But it's reflective, so it means you have really low losses. You can handle really high power, and you don't have any impact on, uh, on, the, on the spectrum, on uh, no chromatic dispersion, and the, pulse, uh, the femtosecond pulses are preserved even for really short pulses. So those axicons, they are really perfect for uh, ultra-short pulse laser processing. I will go quick on that, but uh, it's important to uh, know and to understand that there are a lot of possible uh, different Bessel beams with an axicon. And uh, uh, finding out the right parameters was actually a tough job that, uh, that LZH uh, did and that we helped them to, to do. When you have an axicon and you change the wavelengths, you are actually changing the Bessel beam. When you change the input, the input waste, meaning the, the input beam diameter, you are again changing the width and the depth of focus of the Bessel beam. And then at the end, you can also change the axicon angle. We have a lot of different possible axicon angle, and it's changing again all the parameters. When you change the beam dimension, of course, you change also the intensity at the, at the, at the maximum point uh, inside the, the interference area. So all this is a little bit different to tune, but it can also be seen as a really good opportunity. And there you can always find uh, a configuration to meet your exact need uh, for your material processing. So those, those uh, Bessel beams that we've been generated with reflective axicon, they are actually the, the Bessel beams with the best quality that we have found uh, actually on uh, literature. And you can see that first on that slide. Because actually here in red, you have the curve, the theoretical curve of a Bessel beam. And you can see in black that you have what you get with our axic, and it's extremely close to the theoretical curve. In blue, you have what you get with actually a quite good quality transmissive axic, and you have a lot of oscillations, which are pretty bad for the processing, as I just uh, said. Just want to mention that here you have a little bit difference between uh, the, the theory and the actual um, the actual measurement. It's not because of the axicon, it's actually because of the, the, the laser beam. As uh, most of you probably know, it's pretty classical with uh, femtosecond beams that uh, they have kind of wings at the edge of the Gaussian beam. And those wings actually, they create this little uh, difference. So we were pretty happy uh, of the quality of the generated beam. And uh, this, is, uh, this cannot be um, seen with a transmissive axicon. So another point which is pretty important to know about uh, those uh, reflective axicon is all the possible setup that you have with them. So you have a standard setup with uh, the axicon uh, being uh, used, uh, I would say, uh, alone. And you have the pressing area here. And you also can use them with a microscope objective. That's also a quite nice setup uh, because with this, Okay. Okay, so I don't know if you can hear me or not. Uh, maybe Tatiana, you can let me know if it's uh, if it's good. I will just wait for a minute. Okay, so if uh, Tatiana can hear me, I would say that everybody's hearing me. So I, I will uh, I will uh, carry on. What was I off for a long time or not? I I don't know. Well, anyway, uh, these are the, the standard setup that you can have. And uh, this, uh, I was mentioning that the microscope objective actually are quite good because you can generate very small Bessel beams. Uh, at last, you have the this setup, 
which will be detailed uh, later on uh, by uh, Mike. And it's actually a very unique setup as well. And this is also the first time that it was possible to uh, use that kind of setup with uh, a Bessel beam, because you have the f theta, but we went actually through uh, a Galvo scanner as well, and that was pretty, uh, pretty unique. So uh, this is also why uh, our IFC can they have the best possible quality because uh, the stability uh, uh, enables that. And I also want to end my presentation by saying that if you have at home uh, when you are uh, staying, uh, doing home office, uh, femtosecond laser and uh, uh, Galvo scanner, well, uh, then you can reproduce uh, part of that at least because now the Canon Direct scan, they are available uh, online. You can buy them uh, off the shelf uh, on uh, Edmund Optics. So I uh, invite all of you to, to, to just buy one and, uh, and try to repeat on that uh, on your own. So after that, uh, that uh, small part about uh, the Axican, uh, I will uh, leave the floor to Mike to explain all the process results that we've got, uh, that we've got uh, with uh, that setup and uh, with uh, LDH. Mike, are you, uh, are you with us? Yes, thanks a lot, Gwen. I will continue. Okay, so hello again. Uh, the next few slides will be about the tests that we did at the lab at LZH. We have two laser sources available for our bezel beam tests. Uh, you can see both of them in the picture on the right. The first laser is a coherent Monaco. The pulse duration is adjustable between 10 seconds and 350, between 10 pic picoseconds and 350 femtoseconds. The wavelength is 1035 nanometers. Maximum repetition rate is 50 megahertz with an average power of 60 watts. Maximum pulse energy is 80 microjoules at 750 kilohertz. The second laser is an amplitude S pulse HP with a pulse duration of 600 femtoseconds. Wavelength is 1030 nanometers. Repetition rate ranges between 1 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz with an average power of 4 watts. The maximum pulse energy of the S pulse is 800 microjoules at 1 kilohertz. With these two systems, we can test a large variety of laser parameters and develop um, laser processes for industrial and scientific applications. Here you can see the bezel beam set up in our lab. I will try to show my mouse pointer. I hope everyone can see it. So, coming from the pinhole at the bottom, the laser goes to the upper left mirror and then reaches the first telescope, that's the numbers 1 and 2. This telescope has a magnification of 0 0.2, with the focal length of lens 1 being 100 millimeters and the focal length of lens 2 being 20 millimeters. There is a 30-degree mirror that reflects the laser beam towards the exicon, which is here. The incident angle of the exicon is 15 degree. After the exicon, we have the second telescope, with lens 3 having a, a focal length of 200 millimeters. Um, you cannot see lens 4 in the setup because it's right under the laser scanner, which is the black box on the right side. This means that we adjusted the setup so that the Galvo scanner with its mirrors is in between the second telescope. Lens 4 is a telecentric f theta lens with a focal length of 100 millimeters. So the magnification of the telescope 2 is 0 0.5. By adjusting the two telescopes, the Bessel beam can be modified, so a lot of process optimization can be done here uh, with regard to the substrate that you want to process. After setting everything up, we monitored the Bessel beam. We used the Spiricon beam viewer for that. Um, with the laser scanner, we moved the beam across the scan field. We could measure a homogeneous intensity distribution um, throughout the scan field. We also moved the camera along the z-axis to measure the beam profile in that direction. By playing around with both telescopes, we could generate better beam length between 2 millimeters and 2 centimeters. We also did some material processing on thin glass. The glass shown here is a shot glass with a thickness of 50 microns. We processed the K-Labs and LZH logo with a single crossing. If you have a closer look at the LZH logo on the right side with a STM picture, 
you can see the bars of the LZH logo being intact and showing a good processing quality. We also tried to drill some holes with the bezel beam. Um, when we had a look at the SEM picture that you can see here, um, we would see a large damaged area um, next to the drill hole. And if you compare that with the picture below, you could argue that um, the secondary rings of the bezel beam also damaged the material. Um, probably um, the chosen pulse energy was too high. It's a very difficult task to find the correct processing parameters with a bezel beam because it, the intensity distribution is very different to a Gaussian beam. A lot of testing is needed here to get the, to get some experience and um, the required knowledge for material processing with femtosecond bezel beams. Okay, so here's a small conclusion. In this webinar, we showed that generating femtosecond bezel beams in reflection is possible with a Canunda Exicon. The reflective Exicon was combined with a laser scanner for the processing, for fast processing possibilities. Um, the bezel beam shape can be modified towards your needs by adjusting the telescope setups. And a processing test showed that it's not so simple to find the correct laser and bezel beam parameters in order to get a very good quality. More experience and tests are needed. LZH and Kylabs will continue their cooperation on these topics besides other planned projects. And now we have prepared a video for you that we would like to show right now. After the video, we will try to answer all your questions. Thanks a lot for your attention. Hi, all. So this is just a, a short video about uh, the work we did together. So take this minute of video to have a look at what we did, and you may also use it to write the question you had about uh, the axicon, about all the technology that we could provide, about what uh, LZH is doing. Do not hesitate to ask questions, and uh, we will try to find uh, some time to answer all of them uh, just after the video. So hope you will enjoy the video. So thank you very much for your attention so far. I hope you enjoyed the um, presentation. And um, now we are open for questions or from your side. And um, yeah, we try to collect all the questions you um, uh, dropped down so far. So we will go through part by part and we'll try to answer them um, right after one to another. So uh, the first question was, uh, what is the shape of reflective exicon? Same as glass one. So maybe this question can be answered by Gwen perfectly. Hi, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely I can answer that. So yes, basically uh, it's somehow it's the same as, uh, as, uh, the, um, oh, as a glass one because it's conical. So we also did a conical, uh, a conical shape but instead of being uh, con uh, convex, it's concave. Or if you want to have a, a diverging beam, then uh, it, instead of being concave, it would be convex. Just meaning that you're digging instead of uh, instead of having it, uh, I would say, at, at the outside of the x -can. But basically, it is also a um, conical uh, part. Hope it answers mm -hmm. your question. OK, so yes, just drop down another question if you have further, if you need further information. 
So um, there was a second question, um, also by Ahmad Odi, uh, number one, <laughs> uh, connected to this topic. Uh, is it uh, curved in the center? It's, a, it's actually a pretty good question. So basically, uh, we cannot make magic. Uh, it's uh, always, you, you always end up having a curved area. The thing that our curved area based on uh, the manufacturing capabilities that we have is actually way smaller uh, than uh, the one of uh, the transmissive axicon. We are talking about a factor of 10 or something like that. But uh, I, 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 do, I cannot say the, 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 the figure. So if you want to have more information on that, uh, do not hesitate to send me an email and uh, I will find out uh, what the exact uh, figure for that is. But basically you can see from the profile that we did show that you have hardly no oscillation. So it means that you have hardly no curved area uh, at the tip of the, the axicon. Okay, hopefully this uh, answers your question. Um, there's another question concerning the uh, laser setup. So, um, or maybe uh, we will first uh, go to this question. What is the sensitivity of uh, axicon to the laser fluctuation? Uh, is it a daily control and how? So um, maybe this deal, um, uh, um, scopes for the um, experimental setup. Uh, Mike, can you tell us something about this? Um, yes. So um, we did not see any situations when we uh, set everything up. So the setup is very difficult and it took a lot of time. But once we had everything set up, set up correctly, um, we could not see any fluctuations. The beam looked fine for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, then there's a question concerning the uh, laser source. Which kind of architecture is Monaco laser? A la fiber, solid state, hybrid, etc.? Yeah, it's an ultra short pulse fi fiber laser. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, maybe we can go to the next question. Um, um, for thin glass cutting, are there differences between Gaussian and Bessel, especially in terms of cutting quality? So um, I think uh, what uh, the results you, you could see so far are, are comparable with a Gaussian beam, maybe not that optimized. So um, there's some more work left for, for better uh, edge quality and also the heat affected zone may be caused by the uh, higher orders of the uh, material uh, of the laser beam uh, uh, needs some more optimization. So uh, we want to come to the same quality level. Uh, of course, I think with a very good optimized Gaussian beam, you see at the moment uh, advantages, but of course we are working on this and uh, yeah, uh, we, we are at the beginning of this uh, process. So then we have a question: Is the result in is the result in question of defects comparable comparable to classical filamentation modification with normal axicon and microscope lens? If not, where's the main difference? Um, so the question is, um, can we realize the defects inside the material with this uh, kind of setup? Uh, I think uh, to give you an an uh, answer at this moment, um, this uh, has to be tested in the future. <clears throat> and um, um, uh, I think uh, there's also some more uh, research needed for this. Okay, uh, one question to Mike, maybe. How is the diameter of the Bessel beam in the scanner set up? Um, the diameter of the Bessel beam was around 40 micrometers for the uh, central point. Um, but this depends on the telescope optics. So if we change the telescopes, we can um, arrange different diameters of the Bessel beam. And um, you, can, you can do a a lot of different diameters. So um, it depends on what you need and uh, what diameters you want. And I'm pretty confident that you can get the diameters you want. OK, thank you, Mike. Uh, I hope this um, answers the question uh, of Tim Hesse. 
and uh, let's go on. Uh, Ahmad Odi number one has another one. Um, what kind of scanning strategies um, can be used with the Exicon? Is it is there something an overlap or something like that? Well, I think um, there are a lot of scanning strategies that can be tested. Um, so we tried to cut in, in a single um, cross. Um, also for drilling, it's interesting to not uh, use other. I mean, with the beam, you do something like percussion drilling. Um, that's not necessary with the vessel beam because you ablate the material everywhere in the volume. So I think there are some new strategies with the vessel beam that can evolve. So that might be even better than the strategies that we have with the Gaussian beam currently. Okay, and um, there's another question by um, Bill Holtkamp. What are the limitations to the length that can be modified in a single pass? What is the typical diameter of the vessel beam? Okay, so as I said, the typical diameter of the bezel beam varies um, depending on what kind of telescope optics you use and what kind of f theta objectives you use. Typical can be 50, 50 microns. It can be larger, it can be smaller. Um, I think it's it will be very difficult to get to below 10 microns. Mm. The limitations... Uh, yeah? Uh, sorry, right? Mike. Uh, please. Carry on, I will just add something afterward. Okay, um, so the limitations to the length, um, it is um, the pulse energy that we use. So um, if, we, if we use the vessel beam, um, the, the laser intensity is not on an, on an area, but it's more um, distributed over volume. So if you compare the intensity that you use with a, with a, a Gaussian beam, you need much, much higher intensity in order to, to process um, your material. So I think the limitations that we currently have is maybe pulse energy, repetition rate, or um, laser power. And uh, just one thing to add, uh, uh, it is an interesting question because uh, indeed there are a lot of different possibilities for the Bessel beam, as you were saying, depending on the, on the setup. Just want to say that in the past we we did try with a pretty different setup, uh, with a microscope objective to generate small bezel beams, and we managed to get down to a uh, hundred nanometers. And on the other side, I just want to say that uh, if you want to play around, uh, we ended up that uh, thinking that it's very difficult uh, to always uh, answer the, the that question that we always have uh, with Axicon. And we have now a calculator online. You can play around. You have you pick up an axicon. You can change the setup. You have little, I mean, a little bit of choice of configuration. You have different uh, microscope configuration and different f theta configuration, which are kind of matching what most people are using, or at least it will give you a first ideas. And you will see that you have basal beams from really a huge range of uh, widths and of depths of field depending on the on the setup. That's it for me. Okay. I think there's yeah. one more question. Yes, um, one more question. Did you try to cut crystalline materials? So um, uh, I think so far it was only the, the glass material, but um, I can imagine that also it, it will also work with uh, other um, uh, material uh, class of materials. Um, so this technique uh, is based on an uh, ablating uh, technique. So so it uh, um, evaporates and, and destroys the, the material. It's not a um, filamentation or something like that, but I think uh, there's uh, some kind of, uh, that there is potential for, to use this for some kind of uh, filamentation process. Okay, so, um, I think we answered most of the questions, or all of them. And uh, with this, um, we really want to thank you for your attention following this webinar. Um, I think there will be uh, some uh, further webinars, uh, especially at Kylabs, but maybe also uh, at SH. So we were happy if you uh, follow our websites uh, for further information. 
Um, after this webinar, you will be also uh, redirected uh, to, to the uh, information bundle. And uh, with these words, I want to, uh, uh, and we want to thank you for your attention and uh, see you soon. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. And just to answer the very last question on our website, www.kylabs.com, or send me an email. See you. Thank you. Bye, yes. bye. Bye. bye.